So uh, we're on the uh, Spartan Dog podcast, and I'm the host, Curtis Daniel, from the class of 95, and I got Mr. Uh, Jimmy Ray on the line with me. Jimmy, how you doing today? Great, Curtis. Hello to all Spartan Dogs and all the Spartan fans around the world. Uh, glad to be with you today. All right, so so normally I, I kind of jump into a story about what you're doing, but for you, I kind of wanted to set the table and, and state some facts, man. So if, if I'm off a little bit on anything, feel free to correct me, but I think I did enough homework to feel like I'm going to get these right. <clears throat> so first and foremost, uh, Jimmy Ray's from uh, from Fayetteville, North Carolina, um, attended Michigan State from 64 to 68, right? Correct. Uh-huh. And then, so your first year, you was on the freshman team, so you played from 65 to 68? Exactly. When I uh, when I enrolled at Michigan State freshman, we were ineligible to play football. So there was freshman ball in 1964, fall of 64. We practiced uh, amongst ourselves and practiced against the varsity uh, after the guys that didn't play much on the games on Saturday. Uh, we were the meat squad for them. Okay. All right. And then won two Big Ten titles. Won Correct. Two, won two national championships, 65 and 66. Correct. Went on a – all right, we're we going to make you cool, Jimmy. We, we, the young people say facts. <laughs> so oh, instead of okay. correct, we're going to say facts. Oh, okay. All right. So then okay. uh, won two national championships, 65, 66. Went on a 19 and one run. Five out of the top eight players that were your classmates were were the uh, the, the top eight picks in the NFL draft. Number one draft pick, one uh, Bubba Smith was the initial, the first pick in the draft. Fact. Fact. All right. Yeah. And now played in, played in the '65 Rose Bowl. Okay. And then you coach some Hall of Famers, and I'm from L.A., so I'm only going to name two because I'm biased, but Marcus Allen and, and uh, Eric Dickerson. And you you were coaching Dickerson when he broke that single-season record? Fact. Fact. All right. Then in 1966, you threw for over 1,100 yards? Fact. First black quarterback from the South to ever win a national championship? Fact. Never lost to them bums up the road. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably my most prized possession. Yes. All right. And then you were never, drafted. Never lost Michigan. You said never lost to Michigan, right? Right. Was it ever close? Or y'all was beating up on them? No. No, it wasn't close. Okay. And then I looked close. up I looked on the thing, so the the crazy part, the year before you played, they beat us and the year after you left they beat us. Uh, that could be correct. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah, so y'all was could doing it. And then you got drafted in the 16th round by the Rams? By the L.A. Rams. By the yes. L.A. Rams. All right. And then and then on there, they, they had you, so all that success in college, but you got drafted as a DB? That's correct. During the time that I played, uh, black quarterbacks didn't play uh, in college, at major college of professional football. So when I was drafted by the Los Angeles Rams following uh, my senior year, I was immediately um, told in the draft, converse, in the post-draft conversations that I was being drafted as a defensive back. So was that was that hard to be? I mean, if you, you pretty much play quarterback through high school and college, but to be asked to play DB on the highest level, was that – a tough adjustment, or was that something you felt like you can do? Well, it was extremely difficult. I I, I, I had to play defense at all. Uh, I played a little bit at the end of games in high school. I'd go back as a prevent safety uh, when the team was trying to catch up or win the game, win the game at the end. But I, that was really as a precaution. Uh, I, throughout high school and college, I never played defense, but I was drafted in the NFL to play defense and try to make a conversion and and practice and compete against people that had played defense all of their lives, right. uh, most of their lives. So it was either that or go to Canada. And if I wanted to play in the National Football League, it, had to, it was going to be as a defensive back. Uh, 
otherwise I could have gone to Canada, the Montreal Alouettes, who had my negotiating rights, and probably still play quarterback. All right, and then now I have one more thing I wanted you to fact check. So, so your hometown, Carolina, they they gave you the key to the city when you still was in college. <laughs> yes, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can you can you talk about that real quick? I know I'm going out of order, but I was reading that, and I'm like, man, was he out of school and they came back? So, I mean, can you talk about that? I guess you kind of maybe put Fayetteville on the well, map. Well, I think, I think, Curtis, because of uh, leading up to – you have to understand the, the, the background leading up to uh, my going to Michigan State – uh, when I played high school football in North Carolina during the Jim Crow era in the South, it was segregation. And uh, black football, high school football teams played amongst themselves, and white football team, high school football teams played amongst themselves. And so when I left to go to Michigan State on the football scholarship, that was the first time... Uh, in the history of Fayetteville, North Carolina, that a black athlete had received a scholarship to a major Division I university. And so the success that I had when I got to Michigan State and going to the Rose Bowl uh, was the city started to transition, as the South started to transition, that was a major accomplishment so then I became the favorite son uh, of the city, and that kind of prompted them to have have a celebration and award me the key to the city for my accomplishments, athletic accomplishments at Michigan State, uh, even though I was from the, the segregated part of town. They didn't just give you a key to the black side of the town, huh? <laughs> no, it was at it was at it was at, it was at City Hall, and Mayor Monroe Evans presented me with the key to the city, and I became uh, an elite citizen. Of prior to that, I was I was not considered for citizenship, but after that, I was considered uh, uh, a, a key representative of the city of Fayetteville. All right. So then, if we go back to high school real quick, so you your whole career in high school, you you played quarterback. Correct. And you, what did you, you started like two years, three years, or what? I started. I started three years. I started. We went to high school in the tenth grade. Okay. During that time, I started. I think I I think we lost three games when I was in high school. I started tenth, uh, eleventh, and twelfth uh, grade. Uh, made all state in football and basketball both 10th and 11th grade year. And, uh, I mean, both 11th and 12th grade year. And then was selected to play in the segregated East-West Shrine game, a high school East-West Shrine game, uh, and won the most valuable play award in that game. And that was when I first was contacted by Michigan State because the presenter of the most outstanding player award was the assistant coach at Michigan State, uh, Cal Stoll, and then the recruiting of my, my recruiting process at Michigan State started after that. Uh, after that, now, now, in, now in high school, were you guys running the ball or throwing the ball or what? No, we were a passing team. We were. Uh, I played for Coach D.T. Carter, one of the most innovative guys early on in in high school football, and we were we were historically known statewide as a passing team. Uh, I was uh, the leading passer in the state of North Carolina, but I didn't hold the record because of the segregation, uh, because I played in the black league and not the the white conference. But I was the leading passer in the state of North Carolina and ironically uh, was recruited to Michigan State as a passer. And then when I got there, uh, I got labeled as a running quarterback. But my high school career... Eddie Smith High School, where they retired my jersey, uh, I was a passing quarterback. Okay. Now, on there, I, I talked to Coach Baggett, 
And I, I was watching a video where you mentioned that, you know, if you didn't go to Michigan State, you may have went to Minnesota. But Coach Baggett was saying that he kind of thought that you might have went to North Carolina College at one point. So can you talk about that? Or what, what were your kind of like your final two or three choices when you were coming out of high school? Well, considering the considering the time, um, I was recruited. It was unprecedented for uh, a youngster in the South to be considered uh, outside of the historical black colleges in the South. Uh, and University of Minnesota was one of the Big Ten schools that had contacted me, and I had a affinity for them because Sandy Stevens from Uniontown, Pennsylvania, is a black quarterback that played at the at, uh, University of Minnesota and was the first black All-American quarterback in the country and won the, won the national championship at the University of Minnesota. And Michigan State was the other school, but North Carolina A&T and North Carolina Central uh, College and Florida A&M, and Tennessee State, and Morgan State, along with Johnson C. Smith, the historical black colleges in the South, uh, it was almost uh, considered uh, a no-brainer that if you were a good black player and you got recruited by those programs, which were outstanding during that time because they didn't have to fight, have to deal with integration, uh, that I would go to a black college. And so I became the, the first guy out of this area that shunned the historical black colleges and went to a major university, went to uh, Michigan State on the athletic scholarship. So did you get any flack from that, from like the black community? Oh, or? Big, big, big time. Uh, my parents... The neighborhood, everybody was up in arms about the fact that I was going up to Michigan State, that um, most of the verbiage and most of the argument was that I was going to be a, uh, I was a big fish in, 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 in the little pond, and I, why didn't I do like everybody else and go to a historical black school, uh, which was like what was expected at the time, uh, my parents were receiving all kind of advice negatively about my leaving and going to a white school, uh, a major university. Uh, and so basically what happened in the end was my parents decided after my being recruited by Michigan State and then advice from the head coach at North Carolina State University, Earl Edwards, who was a former Michigan State assistant, but couldn't recruit black athletes into the Atlantic Coast Conference because of the, the laws assured my parents that Duffy Doherty and the Michigan State, Biggie Martin and the Michigan State uh, administration was a, was a great place to be and had a, a great history of playing uh, African-American uh, ball players. And my visit confirmed that when I went there to visit. And so... I took a I took a leap of faith and uh, headed out to Michigan State. So so man, you to to me you just really it's hard to imagine. But so your trip there, you took a thirty six hour train ride to get to East Lansing. Uh, yeah, but that wasn't my initial trip. My <laughs> initial trip when I flew out there as a recruit uh, because they paid for it was my first airplane flight. I oh. flew there. Okay. Uh, and um, that was the first flight that I had, had been on, the first airplane I trip I had ever taken. But when I went back at the at the when I accepted the scholarship to go back to school in the fall, uh, they couldn't pay for my trip up there then, so I had to get there on my own. And rather than take the bus, the mode of transportation for blacks during that time was either the bus or the train, and I took the train and it was a 36 hour trip on the train. Yes. Correct. So, so when you, I mean, traveling in that time, I, w I was reading how they were saying, um, you know, Duffy had, you know, he was doing the clinics for some of the black coaches and they mentioned that they used to drive down in the middle of the night. 
um, just for concerns and stuff like that for their safety. Were, were there any issues or concerns with you being, I guess, about 17 or 18 years old riding a, a train by yourself without your parents? Oh, it's, yes, it was. I mean, I had to. You you could only sit in certain box cars on the train at the uh, near the end of the train, and you weren't allowed in the dining uh, car on the train. So I had to make sure that uh, there was fortunately for me there was a black uh, conductor on the, a, a pullman on the train. They called at that time a black pullman on the train that alerted me that when we got out of the south, when we got out of the area headed up in toward uh, Pennsylvania when we had crossed the Mason-Dixon line, and it uh, was okay to go to the bathroom, but still couldn't go to the dining car. Uh, but it was it was it was safer once we got up past up past Richmond and Washington D.C. and headed out into Pennsylvania t- in toward Ohio. Uh, it got a, it uh, it wasn't as it wasn't as aggressively adversarial at that point. That uh, seems weird because it, it seemed like you were on the train with a group of people that maybe had a, a mindset, but just because you crossed a borderline, it it changed. Well, that was that was that was the difference in the in the during the time. That was the difference in the where segregation and Jim Crow existed in the South and, and not in the, in the states that it didn't exist in the North. It was still practice, but wasn't, wasn't law, wasn't a law like it was in the South. That the, the, the concerning the color, the, the drinking fountains, the theaters, and the, and the restaurants. You weren't allowed to sit in a restaurant and eat, or allowed to go in the front of the theater, or allowed to drink from the water fountains or the back, use the bathroom in the South, but in, when you cross the Mason-Dixie line where Jim Crow didn't exist in the northern part, in the northern part of the country, uh, there was no laws against that. Okay. All right. So then, now, real quick, I went out of order. Now, let's, uh, Jimmy. You are you you currently you married or? Yes, I am. I've been married to my wife Edwina, uh, who is also from Tenville. Uh We celebrated our fiftieth wedding anniversary. Uh, last year and um i have two children uh my daughter has two 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 beautiful children uh, my grandson uh, one of her children my grandson is a sophomore basketball player at uh, boise state university he has an 11 year old sister that uh attends the honor roll school in uh, sugarland texas her husband is a former pro basketball player in Europe named Derek Austin. And my son, Jimmy the Third, is played uh, collegiately at San Diego State, uh, signed as a free agent with the Los Angeles Rams at that time, is now the assistant general manager of the uh, Houston, Texas Football Club in the National Football League. All right, now back up real quick. Now, your wife, you said y'all been married for 50 years. And I'm I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at your stats. You've been coaching for just over 46. So can you talk about what type of person your wife is to kind of, you know, to be, be married to you and be married to a, a coach for, <laughs> for like 45 years? And then I was looking, you know, at your stints, and I was like, you know, he, he spent the most time at Michigan State when he first started and then in KC, but – Every couple years, there was like a move and things. So, can you you talk about you know what type of person your wife is to kind of to be to be supportive uh, of of what you got going on? Um, Curtis, I wish I could I wish I could uh, truly explain uh, the type of character and strength of, and conviction and purpose that uh, I was fortunate enough to. Uh, be involved and in, in, uh, live my life with uh, tremendous strength, strong individual, uh, raised two kids, it was a college graduate, uh, finished uh, college, uh, worked with the IBM uh, when we were in East Lansing uh, for a while, uh, forfeited her career for the betterment of my career and, and the family, 
basically raised the two kids because I was early on that when I started coaching, I was involved in the recruiting process and uh, gone most of the week except the weekends. And then uh, all of the transitions that we made uh, fighting the fight uh, of trying to climb the ladder to become a head coach and, and taking promotions and moving from city to city and state to state. We moved quite a bit. I think we finally settled. My kids settled the most for the, for the secondary part of their education in Southern California when I was coaching for the Rams. Uh, and then from there they went to college. And then she continued to uh, support my endeavors in coaching and followed me further uh, around the country. But uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous selfless person, uh, strong will and character, and very supportive. Uh, I was, I was blessed. Okay. All right, and then so now, uh, Jimmy, can you can you can you explain what what you're doing now and what what your well, well I, I want to divide this into you know what your I guess the other people I say what's your your real job, and then I want you to kind of talk about you know your foundation and the stuff that you got going back back on at home. Well, <laughs> I, I yeah yeah I, I have uh, I work. For the National Football League, Troy Benson is the executive vice president of football operations. Uh, he's the the second in charge to Roger Goodell, who is the commissioner. And Troy Benson uh, is the executive uh, vice president of football operations. And I work him uh, in the career development, diversity, and inclusion uh, part of the National Football League. Uh, trying to uh, identify uh, in issues that exist with minority hirings uh, and dealing with um, helping to grow the game, continue to grow the game, and trying to uh, identify through the coaching end of it because I spent 37 years in the NFL as a as a coach and still presently head of the. NFL Coaches Association uh, deal with uh, the coaches in terms of um, diversity issues or trying to um, improve inclusion in the hiring practices of coaches and front office personnel, as well as dealing with uh, officiating and and coaching and the NFL coaches, not the head coaches, but the NFL assistant coaches, problems that arise in terms of the pension uh, litigation and contracts and changing uh, jobs and and pay and things of that nature. So, so how did how did you end up in that role after coaching? It just was from all the experience that you had that they was it something that you seeked out or they approached you and was like, Jimmy, would you mind? you know, helping us out, or how did that come about? Well, they they basically uh, formed a, basically a support group or a task force or a career development panel, if you will. And because of my, uh, I think probably because of my previous involvement as president or head of the NFL Coaches Association and having had some direct uh, contact and dealings with the commissioner during the time that I was doing the time that I was involved as, uh, with in coaching and and head of the coaches association, we established some rapport and a relationship, and I think uh, it developed from that. Okay, and then I, I wanted to ask you something. So when when you was talking about your wife, and you were talking about the various moves that you were making, you said you were making them with the hopes of you know, getting closer to being a head coach. And so I've seen, you know, the assistants, the offensive coordinator, the assistant coaches and stuff like that. Um, can you talk about some of the challenges of, of, I mean, when you were coming through there of, of or was there ever a time when you, you thought you were going to be a head coach and then it, you know, it kind of didn't happen or. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, sometimes, you know, timing is everything. 
And I, when I came along and joined the National Football League, I was one of three, uh, only three black assistant coaches in the entire NFL. Myself, Elijah Pitts, Lionel Taylor, and Alan Webb. Uh, we were the only four black assistant coaches in the NFL. And as as I grew in the in the business and and distinguished myself as a as a as a good coach and got jobs and became the first black coordinator in the National Football League and then assistant head coaching jobs. I was interviewed for head coaching jobs uh in the in the middle of the late eighties. Uh but at that time they wouldn't hire him. uh the NFL they wouldn't hire blacks as head coaches. So uh I kind of um kept my head down and grinding forward and moving to my moving in positions to better myself and to to get the recognition from my peers to be in a position to be uh, considered for a head coaching job, but uh, it just I just was ahead, a little bit ahead of the curve, and it, it basically didn't happen. And then when the transition started to take place after Art Shell was hired as the first black head coach in the modern era, uh, I was my star had crested, so to speak, and I was considered on the other side of too old to. Uh, to, to at that point to be <laughs> to be considered uh, that was uh, basically uh, the thought process of of the people doing the hiring. Uh, so I I did all of the things that I uh, I, I never really I, I I aspired to be a head coach, but it wasn't something that that I was. Uh, overzealous about having that it had to happen. I understood it wasn't a birthright, uh, and I enjoyed what I was doing. I had to respect the the guys, the, uh, the other coaches in the business, as evident of the fact that I was named the uh, head of the NFL Coaches Association and all of the things that we did to better the environment and the uh, working conditions for assistant coaches. Uh, I just never got the call. Uh, after the interviews that I went through, I never got to call to become a head coach. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Just the <clears throat> why well, I wanted to put all of those facts out, you know, in the in the beginning. Um, just you know, for me, even going to Michigan State, I just I never never even maybe I was naive and didn't you know didn't tune up to hear the history, but I just you know before I said it wasn't told, I just never seen it or never heard these stories. And then I'm, I'm thinking uh-huh. about the period of times when, you know, we were struggling as a program and, and they were looking for coaches. And, I mean, I don't know, did did you never not want to coach college and, and that wasn't an option or did the school never even considered it? Or, because, I mean, you know, you. Oh, no, it, I was, no, I, I was interviewed. I was interviewed three or four times for the head coaching job at Michigan State. Uh, I was the first, the first time, uh, I think that I went through the process of being interviewed. I, was, I had been, I hadn't been in in college coaching for a while, uh, but I did still have a relationship back in East Lansing. I think the first time that I was interviewed for the job, uh, Muddy Waters was hired. Uh, the next time that I was interviewed for the job, uh, Nick Saban was hired. Um, and then I think the 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 last time I was interviewed for the time for the job, John L. Smith was hired. And uh, after that point, uh, it, it 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 became you know clear that 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 they would not that I wasn't gonna I didn't go through any more interview processes with them. Right. Uh, I still maintain my loyalty and love for Michigan State, but I I recognize the fact that. Uh, it wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to happen there. Okay. All right. And then um, I wanted to just go back to, again, I'm jumping all over. Sorry, man, because I just read so much stuff. But you guys, is just the, the season when you guys were playing in, in, in 65 and 66, um, I mean, you guys were, you know, like you said, it was different rules and different circumstances in the North. But you, you guys had to travel when you played games. So how was it when you guys were going on the road? Were there any places 
were, were most of the places in the Big Ten accepting, or was it, you know, a challenge when you well, went to other yeah, places well, as well? Big, the Big Ten and the Pac-8 at that time, Southern California, UCLA, Washington, Oregon, the Big Ten was the, and the, the Pac-8 were the dominant conferences in the, in the country, uh, and the Pac-8. Uh, we never we never had a scheduled game while I was there that we played in the South. Uh, the games that we played against Southern teams, like I mentioned, I opened we opened against North Carolina State, but it was at home against Michigan State, and the head coach at North Carolina State had been a formal assistant at Michigan State, and one of the guys that uh, was the impetus behind my going to Michigan State, Earl Edwards. But we played them in each Lansing, and then all of the other games we played were in the Big Ten, which were all in the Midwestern part of the country. And Michigan State and Minnesota were the forerunners of having black athletes, uh, premium and star black athletes on their squad. Michigan had a few black players. The Notre Dame team we played in '66 in the in the infamous 10-10 tie game only had one black player on the squad, Alan Page. But um, the rules the rules in the Big Ten were there because Michigan State had been the forerunner uh, of all the great players that were came ahead of us at Michigan State prior, that won the national championships in the 50s had, had great black players on them from the Clinton, Saginaw Valley area. Uh, Don Coleman and Leroy Bolden and Ellis Duckett and uh, all of those guys that played at Clarence Peaks, all of those guys that played at Michigan State ahead of us were uh, from the state of Michigan and the Saginaw Valley and the Flint area. Then in the 60s, during the segregated times in the 60s, when Gene Washington, Bubba Smith, George Webster, Charlie Thornhill, Jim Summers, Jim Garrett, myself, when all of us came out of the South and went to Michigan State, that was the second era of Michigan State being dominant in the Big Ten, and we won back-to-back Big Ten championships, national championships, played in the Rose Bowl, and then the, the 66 game, the infamous game of the century, the 10-10 tie against Notre Dame. Uh, those teams were uh, dominated by uh, mostly outstanding black players from the South that could not be recruited to go to major universities uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line or in the southern part of the country, particularly not Texas, Georgia, and North and South Carolina. All right. And then just a couple more things. So can you talk about um, um, your coach, uh, Duffy Doherty? Visionary. Visionary. Uh, smart. Uh, uh, a guy ahead of his time. I, I think I think the fact, the thing that helped us, or the thing that helped Michigan State with with Duffy, when he took over as head coach from Biggie Money, was Duffy was from Bonesboro, Pennsylvania, a coal mining uh, community in Western PA, and lived in a diverse neighborhood. I grew up in a diverse neighborhood uh, with coal miners and blue collar working people, and became a coach. And uh, he had uh, he he had an open mind in terms of 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 color. Uh, acceptance of color and giving opportunities to people less fortunate and from less from lesser circumstances is evident of the fact that during the time of his recruiting uh, in the South of Michigan State, he uh, developed a bond with the coaches in the South that wasn't allowed to come to his, the black coaches in the South that wasn't allowed to come to he and Bud Wilkerson's coaching the year clinics that were held all across the country at that time, and even in the South. And so he started uh, a, se- a separate clinic for the black coaches because they wouldn't allow admission into the, the white coaches association uh, clinic. So he started a different clinic for to allow the black coaches uh, an opportunity to learn and grow as football coaches. And that, in turn, uh, partnered him or gave him a relationship with the black coaches in the southern part of the country that uh, that pushed all of their, uh, that pushed or recommended all of their outstanding black athletes to Michigan State, uh, as well as up at Minnesota where Carl Eller and Bobby Bell and Sandy Stevens, who, but he wasn't from the south, but 
but those guys played. So it was uh, he was a uh, he was a, a guy ahead of his time. Uh, uh, had uh, had great uh, had had a great vision for the future. Uh, was courageous in terms of dealing with minorities. Uh, we were the first team of of any year to have uh, co-captains that were black, both black, uh, George Webster and Clinton Jones of the 1966 football team. And he had, and I had a, a lot of times in talks with him about the things that were going on when he made the decision to make me the starting quarterback, the things that he endured, the letters that he received, the names that he was called, uh, and the names that I was called. And he did a great job of, uh, of, of taking me and walking me through those, through that time, uh, explaining to me about, uh, society and the evils of society and how to deal with that and not be confrontational, how not to, you know, to, to bite back. Uh, so I, I, have, I have a tremendous amount of respect for what he did, what he was about, what President John Hanna was about during that time, and the things that we were able to accomplish, which have stood the test of times and, and integrated football uh, in, the, uh, in the country. Uh, I'm amazed now that when I watch college football on 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 TV, that it's unusual to see a team that doesn't have a black quarterback. Right. And when I play, and when I played, I was the only starting black quarterback in the major university in the United States. Um, so what does he? They was in, probably trying to kill you, huh? <laughs> the other team. <laughs> they could have got to me. <laughs> if they could have got to me, they probably would have. <laughs> See, they probably got a, a super scholarship for knocking you out the game, man. <laughs> yeah. So then real, real quick, I only got two more things. So then now I just wanted the book, The Ray of Light. Like what, I mean, y'all just, it came out a few years ago, but I was listening to the author speak, and I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on it. Like what what made you decide to do the book? And it, 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 it ain't really just like a sports book, but it's you guys took a different approach. But I'm, I would imagine – being the first black quarterback from the South to win a national championship and all the success in the NFL and all this stuff that somebody would have approached you before, but what was it about Tom and why did you agree to do this book? Well, Tom, uh, interestingly enough, Tom was uh, went to Michigan State. He was in Big Rapids, Michigan. His father was a professor at Paris State, and he became uh, the sports editor in his time at Michigan State, of the state news, the, the, the campus newspaper. And Tom uh, ventured out of that in journalism school and went, uh, became a writer for the San Diego Year Union Tribune. And while my son was a, uh, assistant general manager at the San Diego Chargers, they happened to uh, meet because Tom was the beat writer for the Chargers. And so he kept... Uh, after my son to introduce him to me, and uh, he had this idea that he wanted to uh, do this, to set the record straight and do this book and uh, get the the history out there and uh, debunk the, the the false rumor that uh, that Paul Bear Bryant at Alabama was the guy that was the, the integrationist in college football, which is far from the truth. And so the second, the second, one of the years during the foundation, he moved back here to Cary, North Carolina, which is a suburb of Raleigh. And during the foundation function of the scholarship dinner and the football camp that we hold, he came to the event and he approached me about it. And I said, no, I, I, I don't, I don't really have, I really don't have any interest in doing that. So he kept asking me about it and told me to start writing uh, some of the, in a journal, some of the stuff that that took place in my recruitment and going to high school in the South and then go being recruited to Michigan State. And fortunately for me, my older sister, Pat, uh, kept a lot of the, the uh, clippings that my mom had about my time of 
at Michigan State and in high school and all of that. So he spent a lot of time with her, uh, going through a lot of that uh, memorabilia and those articles and all of that stuff. And then finally, he and I got together, and it took a couple of years uh, because I was still coaching. So in the, a week or two in the time that I was off in the summer, uh, I would spend with him, and we, he started to put it together. And uh, that's kind of how it evolved. Okay, and then and then um, so all the places that that you've been, and with all that you're doing, why is it important for you to maintain a relationship with Michigan State? And how how is that? I mean, do you you have a relationship with Coach D'Antonio and a couple of guys up there? Well, you can't you can't you couldn't even Curtis, you can't even imagine uh, uh, how indebted I feel to East Lansing and Michigan State University for the opportunity that they gave not only me. But uh, all of my teammates that were from the South, uh, without that opportunity, uh, our lives could have been, uh, did not, it could have been totally different. But they were, they were on the cutting edge of, of, of change and uh, giving us the opportunity to come play football. And in my case, uh, to get an education, which was uh, the most important part, because I couldn't go to Michigan State thinking that I was going there to be a pro football player. I was a quarterback, so, and that and that wasn't happening in pro football. So the opportunity to go there and get an education and have that opportunity uh, to play football at a major university with the with with what they uh, afforded us, uh, I've been. Uh, a great advocate and champion of Michigan State and what it stands for from an educational perspective and from a development perspective. I've had close relationships with all of the coaches that have been there. Uh, I'm extremely proud of what Mark Antonio has done in reviving the image and the, the, the tradition of what Michigan State stands for as well as Tom Izzo and the basketball part of it. Uh, and have tried to maintain uh, a great relationship with Dr. Luana Simon and uh, Mark and Tom and be be of uh, any help that I can in terms of furthering the cause of inclusion and diversity and opportunity for minority student athletes as well as women and uh, female athletes. All right, and the last thing I always ask people for us of our generation, I always ask them, when you hear the term Spartan dog, what does that mean to you? But but it, I, I do want to tie in one parallel that I noticed from reading the book. It's like you guys are, seem like you guys are brothers for life, the guys that you played with. And I feel that way about the guys that I went to school with and even the ones that I'm connecting with now. Can, are you able to put your thumb on what it is about Michigan State that, makes people feel like that and why we all feel connected. I mean, I didn't have a problem speaking to you. I told you to talk to Coach Baggett and Cole called you. And once I said I played at Michigan State, it was just real cool. So is, is, can you can you talk to that about what that is about that place? Um, I, 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 think it's, I think it has – I think it's the broadness of acceptance and uh, opportunity that it creates for for all people. I think the, the football, uh, the part that we're involved in, the football is the tie-in of the rallying point of the bigger picture of Michigan State University, which is uh, acceptance and, and opportunity. And when you, when you become a Spartan, uh, you develop a love for, uh, because of being a land-grant university, it has all, has all the, an environment that creates and invigorates uh, acceptance. I, I think it. Uh, I think it gives you a, a bond, uh, a lifetime bond of acceptance and and a belief and knowing that uh, everybody is given an equal opportunity to be successful in their chosen endeavor as they would like to be. And the rallying cry of "Go green, go white" is is something that. Uh, is internalized and becomes uh, a part of you and a part of your nature uh, and something that uh, 
you uh, carry with you for a long, long time. All right, cool. So that's it, fellas. Uh, the Spartan Dog Podcast, Curtis Daniel with Jimmy Ray. And Jimmy, last last thing is that I want to say that a, a good friend of mine is currently coaching with the Arizona Cardinals. We had a conversation, Brinson Buckner. He's been in my weddings and everything. And when I called him and told him I was talking to you, he just told me to make sure I express how appreciative he is of you. He's told me that you're a mentor to – not only black coaches, but other coaches. And um, it was a funny story when Baggett, when I was telling him about my friend coaching, he basically was saying that, you know, he needs to talk to my buddy Jimmy Ray, ask him, do we know him? And I sent Brinson a text and I said, you know, Jimmy, he said, man, Jimmy's the guy that recommended me to be in that, you know, head coaching's program. So um, I didn't want to end the podcast without saying that, but he he spoke very highly of you, um, Coach Baggett spoke very highly of you and I just want and from what I read I'm I'm very respective of what you've accomplished and I appreciate you taking the time to be on the podcast with us. Well I certainly appreciate you having me and uh even though I'm not of the of the era of the and to understand the spot and dog I I, 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 I get that. Uh, I get it. Uh and Brinson and Charlie Baggett and hopefully Tyrone Willingham and uh, Tommy Graves and Larry Bethea and the lives of the Spartan uh, players that I recruited and touched and the lives of the coaches that uh, I've been able to mentor and help uh, in college in the National Football League. Uh, I'm very uh, I'm very respectful and proud of that and uh, hopefully there's more to come and hopefully uh, Michigan State uh in the not too distant future, can end this 50 year drought of, of nat- not winning the national championship. And I'm certainly pulling for uh, Mike D'Antonio and, uh, and the Michigan State Spartan football team. All right, cool. And my last fact is it took 19 more years for a black college quarterback to win a national championship. And that black college player went to my high school. Mr. Jamel Holloway. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. That's great. Uh, excited to play. All right. I appreciate it, Jim. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Curtis. All right.